on from Jonathan. This talk is being held on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners of this land. I also would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. And my topic, as Jerry said, with that very kind introduction, um, is wandering in Judaism for 40 years. But just as there was a lot going on before the Israelites started to wander, their wandering in the desert, there is a bit to go through before we get to my 40 years. So we'll start, and it's, it's a very simple path, but it has got some bends in it. I was born in Colac in 1929. I don't remember meeting any Aboriginals in the town at all. Um, the local people there were the Galichdan. Um, they suffered very badly in the early years of European settlement. I also don't remember that there were any Jews in the town, or not as far as I knew. So it was just a good, decent-sized country town in Western Victoria, um, on very built on very fertile land, because only a few years ago, in geological time, um, there were some volcanoes, and they left very nice soil there for farmers to come in years to come. Okay. Um, my parents were Presbyterian, nominally, and um, so our family we grew up. Uh, they, my father served in the First World War as a doctor. Um, he married when he came out of the army, married Louis Grant, and they moved to Colac where um, they didn't have any connections in Colac, so it was a brave move for the young couple. They weren't quite so young because their marriage had been delayed because of the dreadful World War I. Um, but they settled there. My father joined an existing practice <coughs> in the town and um, they had a small local hospital where I was born. Um, I have three siblings, or I had three siblings, two brothers and a sister but um, we got along very well. Uh, they, I was very much the youngest. My sister was five years older than me. My brothers were even older than that. Um, sorry? Yes. Um, as children, we had a great time. Um, I said that my parents were nominally Presbyterian. That means that we went to Sunday school where I did learn and remember some of the Bible stories and learned about the activities of missionaries um, in what was then New Hebrides, now those known as Vanuatu, which rings a bell for at least one person in the audience. Um, education raged highly very high in our household. Uh, my father had chosen to go to Geelong College rather than Geelong Grammar in virtue of a scholarship he would to received when he was very young. Um, his father had been an elder in the Presbyterian Church um, at Nathalia, which is a small town near Echuca. Two of my father's family were early settlers in the Northern Territory. One of them married into the local Aboriginal community and from that marriage are descended many excellent AFL players, some of whom even played for St Kilda. <laughs> um, now, 
I suspect that my father's experience of the First World War made him uh, rather put him off religion, but um, he worked closely with the Presbyterian minister there uh, during the Depression because there were a lot of people who were needing help and assistance. My mother's family had a more interesting interaction with religion. My mother was the youngest of five, and none of those five were christened. This is in the 19th century, 1800s. Um, that's because my grandfather, William, um, who was born in 1833, just in the arithmetic, um, was a strong supporter. Um, well, he was a, a free thinker. Um, he, he once apparently told my mother that he was a free thinker until the locals realised that that was almost a compliment, so they stopped that. But uh, he was a strong supporter of the state, keeping its nose out of the region. Um, this was the era when the notion of free, compulsory and secular education first came into Victoria. Um, he was, my grandfather was born in Edinburgh, but um, my, that's his, his father. Uh, he was born in Edinburgh, but uh, came now to Australia with a couple of his siblings. Uh, they, that was a large family. Um, and I think it doesn't, it's not written down, but I think they must all have been rather um, delicate, possibly potentially suffers from TB or some lung problem. And what one reads of Edinburgh in the 19th century, I'm not surprised to hear it. It was called Old Reeky or Old Smoky. Um, they moved to Carlton, well, now we come back to the, get a little bit more close to it. Um, Dad went into practice in um, Colac. Um, Oh, he, um, one of his letters, he wrote re letters to my mother, who was his fiance, all through World War I. And uh, in one of these, uh, he mentions that he'd spent a couple of nights at the same billet as a field rabbi. That is, and he described as a very nice fellow. Colac, in the early 1930s, a great place to grow up because, as I say, it was a, a fertile district, so the farmers managed well there. Um, and uh, I went off to Colac West State School, had a lovely time there. Kindergarten was just a, a small kindergarten nearby. Then four years, grade three to grade six at Colac State School, um, where we had Terrific, um, terrific grounds. It, it amazes me when I go back to Colac to see the amount of land that was set aside there for the school children. What, I, I have, so to speak, no problems with being at school. Um, you know, just to boast a bit, both my parents were very intelligent people. Um, so they managed to produce four quite intelligent children. What, what I do remember of being at the school was in grade six the last year, um, Mr. Smith set to work one day, took out all the chalk, the coloured chalk as well as the white chalk, and did a most beautiful geometric proof of that well-known theorem, which is that the square on the hypotenuse is the sum of the squares on the other two sides. Pythagoras, and we all know his name and love him. From the uh, state school, I went to the high school for three years, a good high school. And um, at that time, now this is 1940 to 1942 that I was there, um, my brothers had long since finished their schooling and were at the university. Um, my sister was at Fintana Girls School, um, but I was the only one left at home. And um, in 
my final year there, 1942, for a short time, or for about no, perhaps eight or nine months, the uh, lady who ran the pathology laboratory at the hospital, uh, Colac was advanced in that it had a regular x-ray unit and a bacteriology laboratory of the hospital, so specimens didn't have to be sent away to Geelong or Melbourne. Um, but this lady was there for some months I think she possibly came from Vienna because she spoke fluent German and every Monday I had an hour's conversation with her every Monday evening for uh, the last part of 1942. Came away with really quite a good grasp of German and was able to write. She required me to write a letter every week. I wrote that letter in German and then she would correct it. Like that. However, um, then it was typical and generally understood in those days that, that you, should do, you should do your final uh, school years at Melbourne, at some school in Melbourne. So I followed my sister and went to Fintan Girls School, which at that time had a small number of boarders. Nowadays it's a day school only. Um, the teaching at Fintana was very good, but I came away from the school saying that I will never send any child of mine to a boarding school. I think it was an unfair comment. It was wartime and things were tight then. Um, oh, I have forgotten to mention an important thing which because it was relevant to my sister rather than to me. Um, she had been a member of the Girl Guides and I think it was through them that she acquired a pen friend in Vienna, another girl who was a couple of years older. And uh, she and Edith exchanged letters. I must say that Edith her, wrote to us in English and my sister had to reply in English, so it was a, a sort of one-sided correspondent. From um, that a little more later, uh, after boarding school, freedom, I went to University Women's College and it really was like being let out of prison. Because of the college, they just uh, let us, trusted us to behave and to sort of look after ourselves made some very, very close friends there. Uh, in particular, one lady called Margaret Head and the other one was Ruth Denman. Unfortunately, Margaret died in July last year, or June last year, but Ruth is still going fine in, in Canberra. So that's a school or university friendship that has lasted for over 70 years. And there were plenty of others at Women's College with whom I still keep in touch. I uh, enrolled in a, a special course that existed at the time, which was an honours course, um, Joint Arts and Science. The arts branch of it was mathematics, the science branch was um, physics. The mathematics was lovely, no, I did The physics was somewhat of a struggle, uh, what we did in our first year simply took, it was a, a scheduled course, uh, pure maths, applied maths, chemistry and physics, that was fine. Second year, pure maths, applied maths and physics. Third year, pure maths and applied maths. And we had exams, final exams there, um, eight hours in each subject, two, two eight hour papers. Um, it was it was different in those days. There were there were no sort of scheduled tutorials. Um, the work was very much on your shoulders. But uh, there was some benefit for me. There was uh, a tutor who came to women's college to get some help, and uh, I think uh, that applied also to the men in the class. There were about 
about 25 of us doing this special course, 23 men and two women. And um, all through my experience at Melbourne University, women were very much lesser. Well, we were lesser people, and lesser, less in number, lesser in respect, perhaps. Um, at Women's College, there were two or three girls, or two or three women, I'm sorry, who were um, Jewish, and uh, at least one I know was a, had come from Poland, but I didn't know them very well. I mean, I knew that they were there, but that was about it. Um, when sort of continued on with my work there, uh, at the beginning of 1949, and indeed when I was away from Victoria, um, my dear father died of a heart attack. He was only 57. Unfortunately, I think the heavy smoking which he had done when he was in the army finally sort of exacted its price. Um, that sort of, I don't know if that upset me um, in my scholastic work, but I certainly failed the examination in physics at the end of that course. Um, and this was a source of some sorrow to me because that is the one and only examination that I have ever failed. However, however, life continues. I repeated the subject and managed to do very well, but at the same time, having been doing something that I'd already studied, I picked up another subject, a second year subject called Theory of Statistics Part 1. And Theory of Statistics Part 1 and I became bosom friends. We, I loved it. It just seemed to me to be a really great topic, a, a great subject. Um, dealing with mathematics, but uh, mathematics with context. This is the thing that we try to mention to all our students, that the numbers we are dealing with have come from somewhere. They're not numbers that somebody's pulled out of the air, but they're the result of measurements that somebody has taken. And therefore, we have the opportunity to take these numbers manipulate them, study them, see what information we can draw from them and provide to others. And um, this was really good. Now I did, so I did second year, uh, I, it's confusing that it was statistics one, but that was a second year sub subject. Statistics two was a third year subject. Statistics 3 was 40 subjects, so I went through all of those and then continued with the Stats Department as working on research and doing, by that stage, there was a little bit of tutoring being given as well. And um, we had visitors, we had um, people coming. You know, I'm thinking I'm totally going on too long about this because I haven't got to the uh, the Jewish part, but still, I, I find this interesting, so I'll inflict it on you. Um, a new top, a new topic suddenly appeared on the statistical horizon or the mathematical horizon called linear programming. Really interesting, and there was a um, a Melbourne graduate in engineering who gave us a talk on it, um, and that I found the subject very now. It, it's because it's very simple mathematics but you have to do some thinking. And so uh, my uh, Professor Bells, who was the head of our department, said have a look at this and see what you can find. I find, found a, a paper in which um, an example was given of this new linear programming and there was a funny feature in the answers um, the answers were all whole numbers. Now, that was not a given if you use this technique. It was not a given that you would always get an answer that was seven instead of perhaps getting 
seven and three quarters or six and a half. But all these answers were whole numbers. Uh, I sort of mentioned this to Professor Bells and said, I'm surprised by this. He said, find out why. And that led me into the notion of looking at linear programming, but finding what you had to do in order to get this whole number. Now, just to explain why that was useful, um, remember the engineer who worked on an oil company? They had to schedule tankers to go from the um, oil wells to different places like Britain, Australia, United States. And to make their schedule, they could use linear programming. And then they could come out linear programming. And they could come out with the answer that you send two and a half ships to Britain and you send three and three sevenths to New Zealand. So that was the sort of thing that the work I was doing was going to fix up. A man, a professor called Morris Kendall from Britain, at that stage visited our department, he visited Australia, and it was agreed that I should go to Britain and do some more research work there because he knew people in his department in Britain who were also working on related problems. And so I got to the London School of Economics. Um, I got there by travelling through the Panama Canal and why did I travel through the Panama Canal? I mean, this is this is back in the prehistoric times when people went in ships, not planes. And, and so um, I've been through the Panama Canal because the problem with the shorter route was that the Suez Canal, there was a little bit of a fuss going on. <laughs> so, there we are. And I remember so we went across the Pacific, which is a long, big, big ocean, so a lot of it, through the Panama Canal, and arrived in Britain, very surprisingly, you know, on the 17th of March, just like today. <laughs> so I had a happy time at LSE, um, met up with a lady called Ailsa Land, and the two of us clicked and we worked very well, and eventually um, submitted a paper to uh, the, uh, because it was the London School of Economics, and Ailsa was quite stuff on economics. Uh, so we submitted our paper to Econometrica, and for tactical reasons, it went out as A. H. Land and A. G. Doig. It did not go with our given names. <laughs> and I could see somebody nodding there and saying that was a good idea. Um, and it was an enormously successful. But that happened in about 1960. I stayed, I was there for a couple of years more. And then Thank you, Robert Menzies. Robert Menzies did something about Australian universities, and the universities suddenly found that they had the money to employ more people and to put up with more. And so Professor Bells went travelling again. He gathered me and he gathered uh, Jeff Gregory from, um, I think, from Sheffield, and Stephen Moritz from South Africa, and the three of us joined the new Department of Statistics, all of us as senior lecturers in Melbourne University. Unfortunately, this meant that I didn't follow up with the integer programming result. Um, you know, I, it sort of was mentioned, but nobody seemed to be terribly interested. So I just concentrated on statistics and um, enjoyed that. Um, and uh, a few years later, um, a newcomer to Melbourne University, a man called Ronald Henderson, who as a student had done some work down 
in South Wales during the worst of the depression in the 1920s. And he came out and he said, one of the things that you need to do is get an idea of the level of poverty in the nation. And he joined the, or was part the, the instigator of the Institute for Applied Economics and Social Research. And he set out to do a survey of the city of Melbourne to estimate the extent of poverty within our city. Um, I was brought into that as the statistician who would look at all the figures and the numbers that they collected. They did a, a very big plan, a very big sample survey, uh, concentrating uh, the selection of, care, of subjects from um, the suburbs where we felt there was likely to be a heavier concentration of the poor and uh, we collected data. It was all put on punch cards, which then had to be put into uh, machines, the punch cards, the machines read the cards, they printed the results onto tape, and those results then were available for us to examine. And that was um, about 1966-67, and at that time, the University of Melbourne was very proud of the fact that it had a computer, just one. And that computer offered, uh, occupied a lot of space in the uh, agriculture, but uh, sorry. Architecture. architecture, thank you, thank you. The architecture, ground, the uh, ground floor of the architecture building. Worked on that. Um, and some years later, and I did read it, um, out came a book called People in Poverty, and that was the summary of the results that we had found. Um, on the basis of that, the um, government was finally pers persuaded to do an Australia-wide survey of poverty. Um, and although I could have worked on it, I had by that stage uh, other things to worry me, so I didn't take part in the Australia-wide survey, just in the one in Melbourne. Partly for that reason, one of the reasons that I wasn't there, was that I had, uh, by virtue of Mr Menzies' generosity, there were a lot of sort of early 30s people new people working at the university. They often had meals, both lunch and dinner, at the then university house. And amongst them, there was a young student, or no, sorry, a young lecturer, research person, theoretical chemist, whose name was Richard Harkle. So now, now we begin. Now we begin. That's all the preliminary stuff to mention what I've been talking about. Um, now Richard's family, uh, Richard's family are Jewish, um, and they're what you might call a colonial Jewish family. Um, the uh, well, the actual surname Harcourt. Um, is derived from the name Harkowitz, which doesn't sound particularly British. <laughs> um, and then there were the Isaacsons, who were also came out. Um, we don't know a lot about the Burgers, um, who were also one of the grandmothers, but the um, Isaacsons had come out at the time of the gold rush very sensibly um, operating clothing shops and uh, spread quite widely through Stall and other country towns. Uh, so, and the, oh no, one of the, one part of the family, now this has got to be a, a Harkowitz, yes. No, 
Oh, Berger, Berger. But Berger was, but Dinah Berger married Israel Harkowitz, that's it, yes. And her brother was a trader and he operated a very useful thing in that time. He had a paddle steamer and was at one called the Wandering Jew. And he went uh, up the, uh, through New South Wales, um, taking his goods along the Darling River. Um, because the Darling River at that time had a lot of water. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the Wandering Jew had a good life and it ended its life at a town called Brewarina, um, which was up on the Darwin River. And this is a very confusing thing. As a Victorian, I think always of the Darwin as being at Geelong. But in New South Wales, there is also a Darwin River. Um, and it's, that's a uh, tributary of the Darling, and it is also dry. Um, but the Wandering Jew is a wreck. Um, and it's at Brewarra now. Um, so these families, the Harkowitzes and the Isaacsons, um, went in for the usual thing of a fairly large family, lots and lots of marriages, and they weren't all, shall we say, pure marriages. There were a lot of intermarriages. A very, it's the looking at the Isaacson Harcourt um, family tree. There's lots and lots of mixes there. But still, that's it. We, um, Richard took me along to um, remember at this stage, um, we're just courting, so to speak, and we went along to the service at TBR, Temple Beth Israel, so that I could learn what the what Judaism really amounted to. And uh, initially that was quite confusing. It was not like the Presbyterian services I had been to. I, I forgot to tell you that um, when I was at boarding school, we had to go every Sunday morning, we had to march from Fintana down to the Canterbury Presbyterian Church, which is some distance away. And we went down there and had to sit in the front pew and listen to the service. Oh. <laughs> so it, it actually put me off. But um, but I found the I was really interested and sufficiently keen on Richard to <laughs> pursue this learning about this new idea. Um, and that stage, that stage sort of, it was quite respectable. I mean, the, you know, there was a, um, well, when we went to TBI at that time, um, the uh, Rabbi Sanger was still there, and um, one of the junior sort of rabbis, and I will mention this, one of the nicest people there was a, um, a girl or a lady from Chile but uh, we learned years later that she was one of the ones who suffered in the problems in Chile. And, and then we had, well, we had nine months in Sweden and three months living at the Cité Universitaire in Paris. Nothing. Yes, it was nice. And then back to Australia. And guess what? A few months later, we had a family of three, not two, and he arrived, and I <laughs> born on, on a Saturday morning, and um, I decided, having uh, actually worked for quite a number of years there, that I was going to resign, have a, a quiet life, so I resigned from the university and became a full-time mother, which was delightful. Still not really in contact with Judaism, is it? Then, um, after a while, 
uh, there was evidence that there was another baby on the way. And this is where we decided that being up the second flight, you know, going up two flights of steps with one child was a bit of a trial, but with two was impossible. So we had to buy a house. And um, Pierre in his baby carriage and I did a lot of house hunting. And finally um, came what really felt really suitable house in Kim. Uh, Richard had to bid for it at the auction. He won. And we moved into Kew, which was lovely. And one of the um, things that was a, a sort of condition was that it should be possible to have a granny flat because at this stage we also had to. My mother, who'd been living alone in Colac all these years since my father's death, came down to live with us. So she spent the last three years of her life living with us. Um, this, this is why we had to be sort of pretty choosy about what house we lived. And this was good. There was a liberal synagogue in Kew, and we started attending that synagogue. And of course, with the children, um, they too. Um, we had another leave. This time we spent a year in um, Ithaca in northern uh, upstate New York, and um, that's Cornell University. And um, then um, three months after that in a town in Germany called Göttingen, um, the idea, well, Richard's idea was that he wanted to work Heisenberg of the uncertainty principle who lived in Göttingen. Unfortunately, he died first. Heisenberg died first before we got there. <laughs> and I think it was lovely, and we went to services at the conservative congregation there. And um, the menorah that we brought there, or there, we still used for the hunter. A little, a nice little menorah. I've at last learned one of the things I had to learn is how do you cope with the menorah, where do you put the candles, how do you light them in what order, and can can you sing the song? But I can't. <laughs> but, but fortunately, I've got a couple of people down there who can. Um, the children um, each had one year at the Mount Scopus Kindergarten, which at that stage was in queue. Um, it, it did close shortly after, not because of them, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, but then um, any sort of further study at Mount Scopus um, would require a lot of travel. It was when we first got there. Now, Nathan and Ellie are here. Yes. Um, now, there was a bus when Michael and Naomi were there, but by the time our children were school age, the bus had stopped. And the idea of getting the children to Burwood is just impossible. Anyway, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm a supporter of state schools. So uh, they, they went to Kew Private School after they finished their time at uh, Scopus. Um, yes. Ithaca was, uh, going back one step, Ithaca was very nice. Um, we, we lived through a, a, a North American winter, learned all the things about snow, and uh, I can remember having to shovel snow you know, so that we could get up the footpath to get in our door. Um, a cute primary school, another, another link. Um, there was religious instruction there, and um, briefly, and, and there was religious instruction for Jewish children. Um, and it was, at the first they started, it was um, a man called Mark Reigert Freiburg, uh, but he went. Aliyah went to Israel and he's now known as Mark Regev, a very noted person.
Um, the children also came to the Sunday school here at Leo Beck because at that time when the number of day schools, Jewish day schools, I think counted as one, our Scopus. I'm not sure whether the Alec had been established, but certainly it was before the days of King David being a school. Um, so the Sunday school here flourished very much. The children did well or not well. And um, but it, it's the attendance of the Sunday school didn't sort of drop away once there was a good, uh, big, big, reliable day school for Jewish students. Um, all of this seems to be missing very likely times when we went on leave. Uh, because the next one, uh, we went to Santa Barbara. Uh, and that's, that's a really nice part of the west coast of the United States. Um, loved it there, had a good time there. It was a very liberal city of there, you know, really. You know, so our, our sort of, our shaky, our rather shaky status didn't matter a bit. And I think we had a couple of months at Cambridge um, when we were all able to hire bicycles, you could hire bicycles um, to get around. But that, that was really enjoyable. And then back to Australia. More involvement, I put the note here saying more involvement in VAB. Also, um, we started really doing really brave things. Um, there were family savers. Um, Granny, Richard's mother, had a saver. Uh, Barbara also had a saver. And, and we, for quite a number of years, you know, I think I'm told by my informant that at least, for at least 10 years um, we were running doing the saver at Carnsworth Avenue. Um, I discovered that I could make very good cops of balls. They were <laughs> edible, they were edible. And the, um, the, this, this was what I needed. Yes, let's bake and cook. And there's a marvellous recipe in it for a seven layer chocolate cake. Made with mozza, always. Oh, it's it's very, very rich, very good. Um, that's one of the big things that we know, I noticed. Um, you can't say if you're a Presbyterian that food is a remarkably important aspect. <laughs> food is important for the Jewish festival. We know it well. I've got here notes for lots of balls. Oh, yes, because, of course, when I married Richard, um, there were certain things that had to be done, or certain things had to be retired. Um, I had to retire pork, and I had to retire ham, and prawns, and lobster, and oysters. And, and all the times I was trying, I was always sort of asking questions, you know, why is this living, and why, why? And it's, it's always, that's, that's the law. Um, now the thing, but all of those, I could say farewell to them very easily. The thing that really hurt was saying no more bacon. <laughs> because all the years that I've been at Colac High School, which was about a mile out of town, so it was a, you know, you rode your bike to school, you rode home in the afternoon, you rode your bike to school, you rode home in the afternoon. <coughs> I always had eggs and bacon for breakfast. Um, giving up bacon, that, that was a suffering. Lots of things there. Um, there were, um, well, we, we, we sort of started at the time when Rabbi Fox was the rabbi here. And then some years later, there was a gap when um, <coughs> Phillips had left the Rabbi Torah for not to right. And the uh, local rabbi was uh, Rabbi Shagrin, who was uh, retired from his job 
Denmark's position in the United States that he came and stayed in Melbourne for about eight or nine months. A delightful person, and he started a study group. Now, I believe that there had been previous study groups, but by the time we were sort of regular attenders here, there was no study group until that I say he got us there. He got us there at, I think, nine o'clock in the morning. Yes. 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 And he was good. He just made, he went through aspects of the Torah and aspects of what he'd be doing and really made the thing, gave it a new life and lots and lots of questions and ideas that we can ask about. So that was very good. Rabbi Torah continued the study group when he arrived and he kept going on it. And then when he left, and again in that interval, the study group continued with its own volition. It kept going. And also at the same time, and I have only, some things escaped my memory. And one of the things that escaped my memory was that during those early years, I think that would be about Philip's time, we had an interfaith group and there were occasions on which our study group would go to a church and sit through one of their services to discover to what extent what they did was similar, to what extent was it different. I have not good recollections of those except for the time that we went to one over in Footscray. And after the service, it was as though it was a market. There was a tremendous gathering of all the congregants and food, lots and lots of it, lots of food. Rabbi Nyman. Now, Rabbi Nyman, I'm going to ask you to come back. I want to go back to a point that I glossed over. Our friend Edith Rowe. Now, my sister had exchanged letters with her during the year 1938. Her mother wrote to my mother asking whether we could possibly sponsor them to come to Australia. At that time, the family, our family finances just weren't good enough for us to do that. But the letters kept coming from Vienna and my mother did her very best. She wrote to the local member of parliament. She got in touch with the officials in the government and every time they said, no, we are not going to let you sponsor these people. No, we cannot do anything. And this kept, they kept trying, we kept trying until early 1939. But unfortunately, it was too late. We didn't know for many years, we did not know that we had to guess that what would happen. The Rolls had never explicitly said that they were Jewish. And I realise now that this was really sensible, that there would have been more trouble for them had they said this. Some time later, in years, many years later, we got a letter from, I'm just trying to find it because I actually had the letter. This letter comes from the International Tracing Service, which was a part of the Red Cross. And it's to my sister 
and it is dated October 91, and they were able to tell us that Dr. Jacob Rowell died in Dachau in January 1945. That Edith Rowell was able to get onto the Kinder Transport and go to Britain, but we didn't ever make any contact with her. Although we tried, we were given an address in Britain, and the people there wrote back and said, yes, Edith was with us, but she isn't now, and we were never able to find out at that stage. Um, Edith's mother, Emily, and her little boy, Fritz, and here is a small connection, they were sent to Theresienstein. So they probably would have been there at the same time as Rabbi Dr. Diogen. But this letter says, no records are in hand here about Edith and Fritz Lowell. Um, unfortunately, the letter does say that Emily Lowell, who is the mother, was transferred from Theresian start to Auschwitz in October 1944. Um, the, there is, I think, an exhibition at the Jewish Museum about the Rolls, and all the correspondence that we have has been deposited with the Holocaust Museum here in Melbourne. Uh, we, we did find out a little bit more about Edith, apparently from Britain. She somehow got to the United States and she died in 1971, but we were never able to make contact with her. Um, the little boy would have been with his mother, so the other members of the family all died. We uh, realise that we are not alone in that sad, as in that sad history. So we come now near to the end. Um, we're going to the 17th of March, 1984. Now, again, it was St. Patrick's Day. What a surprise. St. Patrick's Day is always on the same day, and it's on the 17th of March. But on that day, 17th of March, is the bar mitzvah of one Pierre Harkin. It was also, at that time, the Q Festival. You know all about the Q Festival. But that year, the prince and princess were local primary school children. The prince, I think, his, his name was David Barnes, and I think he went to his Q Priory. And the princess is none other than that lovely lady, Leonie Hutton. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs>